Now let's just briefly touch on VOR suppression and then in the final stage we'll just go through the uh, velocity step in a brief case study as well. So VOR suppression is a very quick uh, one to mention because as I described earlier it's really a, uh, a, a brief test of uh, central uh, neurological mechanisms ability to suppress uh, the nystagmus. But what we have here is the same setup as the sinusoidal harmonic acceleration. So the patient is rotated from side to side, but this time, rather than being in darkness, they're provided with a light and uh, they fixate on the light. And under normal circumstances, the, uh, the, the nystagmus driven by the VOR will be uh, suppressed. It will just be reduced because the smooth pursuit mechanism is tracking the target that they're, they're looking at. And so the analysis of the response, and you might just do this at two uh, speeds, maybe a low speed and a medium or a high speed, is the uh, size of the, uh, the, so the gain in the first place that you get from the sinusoidal harmonic acceleration test, and then the size of the reduction uh, in that um, at the same speed when you actually have the test with the light on. Now, normally, uh, you would expect uh, the suppression to be around about 80% or, or better. So if there's a reduction of less than that, then it may indicate a, 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 neural, a neural abnormality. Um, and in some ways, it's analogous to the, um, the, 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 the VOR suppression test that we perform routinely in calorics. Uh, sometime immediately after the peak of the caloric response, we'll give the patient a target to look at and again test their ability to suppress the uh, caloric-induced nystagmus. Now, uh, now the final test in the test battery is the uh, v velocity step test. Now, this is a lot quicker than the sinusoidal harmonic acceleration. It's just an impulse, a brief uh, acceleration, um, and then deceleration. And so the acceleration uh, gives us a burst of nystagmus, and then we will maintain the patient at a constant velocity where the nystagmus will then subside, and then we will decelerate the patient um, and we'll then measure another burst of nystagmus. And the initial burst, the acceleration, is known as the per-rotatory phase and then the deceleration, the post-rotatory phase. So we spin the patient constantly around and we measure the acceleration and then step two would be the deceleration. And in the acceleration, as you can see on this slide, the uh, leading ear, in this case, if we were rotating to the right, then it would be the right ear, measures that as a, uh, senses that as an excitatory response, while the trailing ear, an inhibitory response. But in the deceleration uh, stage, then the pattern is reversed. Now the, the leading ear, um, because it's the opposite, it's a deceleration, now the leading ear, the right ear, uh, senses that as an uh, inhibitory response, while the trailing ear, the left ear in this example, um, an excitatory response. And uh, the, the specific measure that we have is the, known as the copula time constant. So in the uh, upper trace here, this is time on the x-axis against stimulus. So we have the acceleration phase, and uh, so velocity from zero up to a constant velocity. And uh, the acceleration phase gives us the copula deflection, as we were describing earlier. And then the copula deflection uh, drives the uh, neural integrator to give us uh, a nystagmus, which is uh, somewhere in the region of um, uh, around 12 to 15 seconds, usually. If that acceleration wasn't sensed by one or both ears, the neural integrator isn't charged up, so to speak, and so the time constant, the amount of uh, uh, neural input uh, provided to the neural integrator is, is less, and so the nystagmus will subside abnormally quickly. So what we're interested in here is an abnormally low time constant, and that will coincide with the phase lead that we showed in the slow harmonic acceleration test earlier. When we go to the uh, deceleration, the post-rotation, so here we have the constant velocity, and then at the deceleration here, um, we have the opposite copula deflection, so we will have uh, the time constant, uh, but in the, uh, in the, in simply in the opposite direction. And so we do this twice. We do an acceleration and a deceleration to the right, and then an acceleration and a deceleration to the left.
But here we have an example of those uh, four time constants. So on the uh, left hand side of the screen here, we have uh, the uh, per, uh, rotary, per rotatory to the right and to the left. And then on the right hand side of the screen, the post rotatory nystagmus to the right and to the left. And what we see is this is the raw trace here. So we'll just ignore that for a moment. But what we see is on each one, uh, perhaps the clearest one that we can see right here is uh, down on the bottom left. We see uh, the nystagmus increasing due to the copula deflection and then gradually tailing off as the uh, uh, copula returns to its uh, uh, resting state, the central position. And uh, what we're interested in is the time taken to uh, the time constant. So for the response to decay from its peak to 37% of its peak, uh, that's this region here between these two dotted lines. The whole response is the, the gray area, um, but we're interested in the time constant between these two dotted lines. And we just have a look to see whether this time constant in these four quadrants here uh, is, is abnormally uh, low. So an abnormally low time constant, perhaps less than around nine seconds or, or lower, could uh, indicate either a unilateral or a, a bilateral weakness. And that should match the uh, phase lead that we were discussing for the sinusoidal harmonic acceleration. To some extent, we might get uh, an asymmetry. And it is possible as well to see a prolonged um, time constant um, for sometimes for central reasons, or alternatively, if you happen to have a spontaneous nystagmus, which, uh, which means that the uh, nystagmus just carries on and on and on. So here's some examples of uh, how to interpret the uh, responses. So we have here a bilateral weakness, meaning when we impulsively accelerated and decelerated the patient in either direction, then that was never really sensed uh, by the ears. There was no charging up, so to speak, of the velocity storage mechanism. And so any nystagmus was either absent or over very, very quickly. And so we have not only low gains, um, so the slow phase velocity of the head and the eye movements is low, but the time constant is, is very low or, or non-existent. In the case of a unilateral weakness, so this is a left uh, unilateral weakness. So what we, would ha what we would expect here is that when we spun the ear up to the left, or when we decelerated from the right, the, a left weakness would not be very well sensed, and, uh, and so we'd have low gains, and low time constants. But anything where the right ear was the leading ear, so that's per rotatory to the right and post rotatory to the left, that would be dominated by the uh, right ear. So the gains and the time constants might be either mildly reduced or maybe within the normal range. And then if we had a right unilateral weakness, we would expect, of course, the, the, the opposite pattern. So. With that, then let me just uh, close in a few minutes with uh, an interesting uh, case study, which I uh, came across courtesy of some uh, input from our colleagues in, in Australia, in, in, uh, in Brisbane here. And this is a, an interesting case where a patient presented in the uh, acute phase of a vestibular insult. And this is a, 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 an extract from the trace of their spontaneous nystagmus. So nothing to do now with the rotation. This is just the head static and a spontaneous nystagmus. And you can see that the nystagmus is similar between the right and the left ears, and it's right beating. Now, a right beating nystagmus immediately implicates a uh, left vestibular weakness. And you can see that it's a particularly strong spontaneous nystagmus of around about 30 uh, degrees per second slow phase velocity. So this patient very much is in the uh, acute phase and they must have been feeling extremely dizzy at this, uh, at this stage in the, uh, in, in the test. So what we have here is uh, some caloric results which corroborate that. So we had the uh, left was the suspect here. And what we have here is uh, we can see that the, when the right ear was tested, we had a, a caloric response, a very healthy caloric response from the right, but a very low caloric response from the left. And in fact, it's, the, it's at the point where we would say that's a hypofunctional ear. We don't know if there's any residual function there. It's uh, the slow phases to uh, stimulation is uh, consistently sort of below 10. Now, if we have a look at the uh, sinusoidal harmonic acceleration results, then here's what we found. And I'm here just displaying uh, one frequency, which is 0.04 hertz. And first of all, we can see the green trace, which is the head rotation. 
And we can see that baseline offset due to the spontaneous nystagmus. Uh, so everything is, is uh, shifted over such that um, we always get a right beating nystagmus. And when we rotate the head to the right, then the right beating nystagmus from the stimulation and from the spontaneous nystagmus uh, add together. And when we rotate the head to the left, uh, it is dominated only by the spontaneous nystagmus. So this is the DC offset, and this gives us uh, a mild but uh, present uh, asymmetry, as you see in the bottom there. But what's most important from this is that the, uh, there is a phase lead, as you can see from the middle box here, at each of the three frequencies that the clinician tested here. So that phase lead is consistent with the uh, vestibular weakness that I was describing earlier. And here's that phase lead, actually, as you can see it. So we have the peak of the uh, head velocity here and the peak of the eye velocity, and the eye velocity leads the, the head velocity by a pathological amount, as you can see from the, uh, the, middle, uh, the middle box up there. Now, VOR suppression. So uh, this is where the light came on and the patient rotated from one side to the other, was asked to be able to suppress the nystagmus. And you can see that there was around about a 70 or so uh, percent drop in the size of the uh, um, nystagmus when they had no visual target to when they did. Now, that's uh, actually a little bit below the normal range. We'd expect patients to be able to suppress the nystagmus by perhaps 80% or more, but in this case, it wasn't particularly strong, spontaneous uh, nystagmus present. So I'm going to suggest that as a red herring there, and there's probably no real evidence of a neurological abnormality. So that's good. And now finally, we'll talk about the uh, velocity step test. So here we have, uh, remember the left is the suspect ear, so we're expecting no neural input from the, uh, from the left ear. Um, and when we rotate to the left, then uh, the right ear, sorry, when we rotate to the right, per rotatory uh, uh, to the right, and also when we decelerate from the left, then we would expect the right ear to dominate that. And so the, post, the per rotatory to the right and the post rotatory to the left are in the normal range. However, in the stimulations where the left ear dominates, that's acceleration to the left and deceleration from the right, well, the left ear is abnormal here. So we have no charging of the velocity storage mechanism. The cupola time constants are abnormally low and uh, um, that's reflected in the chart there. So that all fits with the, uh, the left uh, vestibular weakness. And in this case, it's uncompensated. And the reason why the time constants, as you can see here, for uh, the right per rotatory and left post rotatory, that's the responses on this side that are dominated by the right ear. The reasons why they're so long, normally they'd be around 12 to 15 seconds, but here they're like 40, uh, maybe 50. That's because of the spontaneous nystagmus that's prolonging uh, the response. Okay, so uh, I realize that time's uh, passing here, so I'll just draw things to a close. Um, and uh, a couple of summary points. So um, it's, I think it's important to remember that uh, the chair, of course, is a, an aid. It fits in the test battery um, alongside some of those other tests that we've uh, mentioned. But one of the key uh, um, uh, key advantages is it allows you to um, uh, assess that residual function. Because if you think about the case that we just displayed, if we just had the calorics on its own, then we can see that there was a left deficit. But we didn't know what, what the extent of the residual function is for higher uh, stimulation uh, uh, degrees. Whereas with the rotary chair, uh, we can see that actually uh, gain was uh, relatively uh, normal. So we, we, uh, we had the phase lead, we had the evidence of abnormality, but we could see that there was perhaps some degree of uh, residual function left in that case. And of course, there are other um, tools at our disposal. In addition, there's the VEMP, which might test the, uh, um, as I mentioned, the linear VOR and elements of the vestibulospinal reflexes, and then the VHIT, which can tell us, of course, about the six canals. Um, in terms of... Uh, the, um, where, where the chair fits in on a clinical application, well, of course, it's very well tolerated. Um, unlike the caloric, there is some degree of uh, um, vertigo that you might expect in the chair, but it's nowhere near as severe as what you tend to get in the caloric. And uh, as a result, it can be useful for um, areas where you need to do repeat monitoring. So autotoxicity or sometimes cases of uh, Meniere's disease where um, caloric after caloric might not be desirable for the patient but a rotary chair might be uh, much more uh, acceptable. 
very important to note that we have this stable uh, calibrated stimulus um, and that really is a, a key advantage without the manual manipulation that comes with the V-hit and without the unknown stimulus that uh, comes inherent to the caloric. But um, we have to remember that it's not an ear-specific test. Uh, both ears will, stim will respond to some extent um, to the uh, stimulus and the res responses are greatly influenced by uh, mental alerting and that can particularly affect the uh, the impulse test the velocity step test that we were just describing because it's so short uh, the slow sinusoidal harmonic acceleration test less so because we average over a longer period of time um, but nevertheless uh, that's something to to of course bear in mind and uh, if anyone is interested in any of these concepts and learning about them in more detail particularly the um, the phase discussion that we were having and the pendulum model of the VOR, then I've provided some references here. And I'll just close and thank you for your uh, long attention there. But thank you so much for your uh, for your time.